in the life of Saul. And I pray this morning that Jesus has made the difference in your life. Now, as we look back at this scripture, this, this is very familiar ground, maybe to many or most of us this morning. I, I've studied this scripture a multitude of times, taught through it. I preach this scripture on many occasions, but as I read it, God began to show me some things that I had never really seen before. Now, as you read this scripture and think about it, now, th this is a, what, what happens here, uh, we, we talked about on Wednesday night, how that, that Saul, uh, being the Pharisee that he was, being the devout and zealous Jew that he was, was going about to destroy Christianity because he realized that Christianity could not coexist with the, uh, the Jewish religion as he knew it. So he began to try to persecute Christians, but he was really persecuting Christ, right? We know that. And he's traveling now. He's got letters from the, from, from the chief rulers. He's got letters from the high priest that he can go and arrest anyone who claims to be a Christian. And he's, he's so zealous. Now, uh, history tells us that Christ generally stayed within about a hundred miles of his home. But the Bible teaches us here that, that Saul was going to go as far as Damascus, about 200 miles, if I understand correctly, to persecute Christians. He was going out that far. He was going to put them in jail. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem. He would like to put them to death if at all possible. But you see, while he's on his journey out there, and he probably had uh, maybe a, a, a small armed escort that, uh, that, the, uh, that the powers that be back in Rome had given him as an, a duly uh, ordained official to go out and arrest these folks. He had a, a probably an armed contingent of men. And they're traveling now for several days out to Damascus. Now, as they near Damascus, you could see this great city. Maybe uh, you, you might see the skyline some several miles away, some of the imposing buildings and such as the like. And they're almost there. And about noonday, there's a light that shines down. Now, can you imagine what a, a spectacle it is when this life but when this light begins to shine down, verse number number three says this. Look at verse number three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Right? We just talked about that. And and it says suddenly, almost like a, a flash, a, a bang. Suddenly, it, it says that there uh, that there was a light that shined round about him, a light from heaven. Now. Uh, as the light shined, it says he fell to the earth, and then he heard a voice. So this light shines. Now, if we move over to Acts chapter number 26 and read verse 13, and we won't do that for sake of time, but that's a different, that's Saul recounting, or the Apostle Paul recounting what happened to him here on the road to Damascus. And in, in Acts 26, 13, it says it was about noonday. So about noon, about now, just about 15 minutes from now, yes I have a watch about 15 minutes from now you see how bright it is outside, they're walking along, the sun up high in the sky beating down on them and all of a sudden there's this great flash of light and this, this flash of light, now, now we're talking about the spectacle. That's my first point, if you're writing it down, is the spectacle of this event. Now, how that it was such a great thing uh, for this to happen in the noonday sun that this light shined down so brightly. Now, we can imagine if you had just come out of a dark room, maybe, and you go outside, what's the first thing that happens? Well, you're blinded almost by the light. It's hard to see out there unless you've got some sunglasses or something if you walk from a dark room right into the noonday sun. But they were in the noonday sun and a light shined so brightly around them that none of those men could see. In fact, it had driven them there to their knees. That's the, the spectacle, the appearance of light. Now, uh, you notice the effect that the light had on these men. Now, I mentioned that before. This light was so 
bright that it blinded them. Have you ever seen a light so bright that it blinded you? Maybe you've had a flash of light that's so bright that it blinded you. Anybody ever took a, a flash photo right in your face before? You felt that maybe for just a, a second or two, you felt a little disoriented because the light came into your, your pupil. The light, uh, the light overwhelmed your retina and you couldn't see for just maybe a second or two. Now, there may be other instances where you've been blinded like that. Maybe many of you men in this room, you've welded before. You know what it's like, Brother Frank, to, uh, to run a weld. Or sometimes maybe you may have hit an arc and didn't have those glasses on, and it temporarily blinded you. Sometimes you may have looked at something while you were welding that you shouldn't and it lasted much longer than that. You had some pain for a while and you couldn't see very good for sometimes it feels like sandpaper in your eyes when your light is overwhelmed by that by that brightness. So it, it would be something like that except it would be extended. You know, if you were to see a nuclear blast from, uh, from miles away, in fact in the middle of the day, if you saw one uh, megaton or one megaton nuclear blast from 13 miles away, it would render you blind for some period of time. Now, at night, if you if you were to see that same nuclear bomb go off in the distance from 53 miles away, it would blind you. What a flash of light that that could be! Listen, all these things. Hell in comparison to the light that came down and shined in Saul's face right there. That very light, I believe, was the glory of God. And without the help of God, listen, this, this light like that nuclear bash that comes in, it actually burns the retina. That's what would happen if you were in a nuclear blast. The light, the light would overwhelm and burn the retina and would cause permanent damage. You would be, you would be if you live through uh, that part of it, you would be blind from then on out. And I believe that Saul and those men around him, but for God, would have been blind permanently. I, I believe that. The light was bright enough to blind them in the noontime. So uh, you see that Jesus... Now, you say, preacher, how, how do you get that that light was, was God? How do you get that that light was Jesus? How, how does the Scripture describe Jesus? Well, it says that He was light, right? If you go back to the book of the Gospel of John and read in chapter number 1, it describes Him as light. We know that. Uh, we know that to be true. John 8, 12 says this, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, also in Revelation 21, in, in, in verse number 23, the Bible says, And the city, talking about the new heaven and new earth, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So we know that God is light. We know that Jesus is God. We know that Jesus is light. And that light shined down. That was the spectacle that happened right there on the spot. We know not only that, but we see here the soul-shaping nature of this event. Not only uh, the spectacular nature of this event, but the soul-shaping nature of this, be of this event. What happened there? Well, look in verse number 4. Verse number 4 says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art, thou, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Saul thought that he was persecuting Christians, but because he was persecuting Christians, he was actually persecuting Christ because every Christian is the body of Christ. So he was persecuting Christ Himself. He addressed Him as Lord there. He, he may not have known the Lord before the light shined around Him, but now He knew who it was when God spoke to Him. Folks, I want to tell you, when God speaks to you, you'll know that it's Him. He had no doubt, I don't believe at that time, that it was God. So he spoke back to God, and God said to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. He said, it is hard 
for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, you imagine that uh, when they had oxen yoked up together, they had these goads. These, they called them pricks, these long maybe pieces of wood, and they were sharpened on the end, perhaps even had a metallic end, and, and whenever the ox would try to kick back, he'd hurt himself. That's how they kept the big animal under control. And what he's saying to Saul is here, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. So Jesus had already begun to convince him and already began to convict him and he was trying to kick against the pricks. It was much like that. He was hurting himself, running from God, thinking he was serving God at the whole, the whole time. Now, you see what happened. The soul-shaping nature of this event. First, it changed his posture. The Bible says that he fell to his knees. He, now, you think about Saul before. Saul was a proud man. Now, the Bible says that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had rose to the top. He was the cream of the crop. He had, listen, he, had, he was from the right house. He was from the right Family, he had been trained at the feet of one of the best rabbis of the time. He was the right man of the right breeding, had the right education, and he was serving God. So he thought. He was an up-and-coming religious leader. He was going to get the attention of the world. And I tell you, what happened to him broke him right there on the spot and drove him to his knees. And if Christ ever comes in, shines into your life, He'll break you like that too. He'll break you down to your knees. Christ will humble you before He begins to lift you up. First you will You've got to get to the end of yourself before you can ever be used of God. And we're privileged to see where the Apostle Paul found his beginning with Christ. You see, he ch- it changed. His posture changed. There, that's what religion does. It says, it says, look at me, how good that I am. I do this and that. I go to church three times a week. I tithe of all that I have. I support the ministers of the church. It, it don't matter, friend, who you are or what you do, what church you're a member of, how many times you've been baptized, how much money you're given. You can die and go to hell without Jesus listen Saul if, if you could make it on your merit Saul would have made it I'm telling you he was a man that was zealous of the law if you could be good enough Saul could have been good enough but he needed Jesus I need Jesus and you need Jesus we need the light to shine in the world needs the light You see, the soul-shaping nature of this event, it changed his posture. Not only that, it changed his perception. It forever changed the way that he looked at things. Look look at verse number 7. It says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. There was only one man there that saw Jesus. Do you know that? There was a a multitude of people. I don't know how many around him, but when Jesus spoke and they heard Jesus' voice, probably heard Paul talking back to him, but they thought it was all gibberish because they didn't see anybody. But listen. The, what, what Saul saw was Jesus himself. He saw the man Christ Jesus. And can you imagine how differently that he began to look at things after that? The, the image of Jesus appearing in his glory before him was forever etched, for, forever burned in his mind. Listen, to Saul or to Paul, uh, Christ was never, uh, never really, he, he couldn't picture Christ on the cross, but he always saw the Christ of glory. I don't believe he ever got over that. I don't believe Saul, I don't believe Paul ever got over seeing Christ in His glory. And if you ever really catch a glimpse of the glory of God, you'll never get over Jesus. I ought to got a lot of amens on that. If you say, you see, it changed his perception. The other two heard voices, but they didn't understand. They didn't see 
They, 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 they may have had a physical occurrence, but the spiritual thing, they didn't understand the spiritual aspect uh, because they were natural men. And you know Jesus has the ability in a crowd this size, there may be just one person right now that's getting alive. There might be one person in this room. To everybody else, they hear my voice. Listen, I believe when God's man stands and preaches God's word, I believe God's speaking. There may be a multitude of people hearing my voice, but only one people, one person seeing Jesus right now for the first time. I don't know how long it took me once I was introduced to Christ to really see Jesus, to really get a glimpse of Him. Until the light really shined in. But when it does, it will change your life forever. He changed his posture. Changed his perception. But I'll tell you something else it did. It also changed his prayer life. Listen, Paul was a man that was zealous. Saul was a zealous man. He, he prayed at least three times a day. He would recite the law. He'd recite the scripture. He was a very zealous man. He kept these prayers, probably never missing a prayer time. But I want to tell you, friend, when Saul got saved and God changed his name to Paul, he began to pray then. He began to pray like he... he listen, the, the Jews, they had a prayer for everything. They had a little prayer that they'd recite for this and a prayer they'd recite for that. And there's some denominational beliefs today that they'll recite a prayer for this or recite a prayer for that or have this book of prayer for that. Uh, listen, I don't need a book of prayer. What I need is a God that I can pray to. And I can pour out my heart through Jesus and get to the throne room of heaven any time, and I can talk to him just like I'm talking to Adam right here, because he's my friend just like Adam is. And he wants to know anything in my heart or on my heart. That's the kind of God that I serve. And it changed Paul's life. Look with me at verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. It changed his prayer life. It changed his priorities. Now, not only was he concerned with physical things. Have you ever prayed so long you forgot to eat? Have you ever prayed so long you forgot to drink? Probably not. Probably ain't anybody in this room that's, had to, that, that's just forgotten it. Now, we've had times that we fasted. Maybe we did without it and we prayed. But there's probably not a person in this room who's just prayed all day before just, just didn't feel like eating because they was drinking from another cup. But that's what Paul was doing. I'm going to tell you, he learned how to pray then. You know how he learned how to pray? I thought about this a lot. Paul knew how. He, he knew all these prayers, and, and, you know, the, the significance of them and why he should pray. But you know why he prayed now? He prayed because his world had been shaken up. Everything that he believed, everything that he thought he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt had just been shaken. He'd just been torn down right in front of him from this one little encounter from Jesus. His whole world was turned upside down. And then he really began to pray. Why? Because he needed God. He didn't need God before. Remember, he had it all figured out before. He had it all figured out. But now, you see, he realized he needed God. Verse number 11 says this. And the Lord said in him, Arise. He's talking to Ananias. It says, Arise and go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he what? He prayed. What was he doing them three days? He was pouring out his heart to God. Listen, his, 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 his physical need wasn't nearly like his spiritual need. He had a hunger for God. He had a desire then because his whole world had been turned upside down. You see the spectacular nature of this event? The soul-shaping nature of this event? Once you know Jesus, your life will never be the same. You see, Saul had a religion. But Paul had a relationship. One in the same men, yet one of those men had to die. 
Saul had to die so that Paul could live under Christ. Listen, friend. Whoever you are or were before you were saved, that man has to die so that you might live under Christ. You see, the last thing, and I'll close with this very quickly, verse number 7, you see the singular nature of this event. What do you mean, preacher? Well, it says the men stood and journeyed, the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, they saw, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. You see, salvation is a personal matter, as I mentioned a minute ago. When the light shines in, it was one man on that road. This life was changed forever. When Jesus came down. See our salvation. is between. God. And man. The Bible says there's, there's no mediator. Between God and man. Christ has torn that. He's, he's, the middle wall partition has been torn out. Now we need no mediator. We can go straight to God through Christ. He's made a way for us. And it's a personal thing to be saved. You know what? I can't save anybody. I wish I could. But if I could, there wouldn't be a soul leave here today unsaved. But undoubtedly, there'll be somebody that'll slip out the door today without Jesus. Maybe somebody that the light has shined in and they turned their back on the light. I don't know what God's doing. You see, Paul was... His conscience had been pricked. I believe his heart was under conviction. I believe he looked back. If you look back in chapter number 7, the Bible says, I believe that's chapter number 6, the Bible says that, that Saul held the, held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen to death. And I believe when he heard Stephen, when he, when he died, right before he died, his last words, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I believe that Saul never forgot that. I think it haunted him at night. I think it kept him up. And I think Jesus continually reminded him of that. I think that seed was planted. And then when the light shined in, it all started to make sense to him. It all started to make sense what needed to be done. And then what did he say? He said verse number 7 or number 6. He said, and he trembling, astonished. He was scared to death and astonished that he was wrong. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What, what do I do now? What do I do with this newfound knowledge? And he said, arise and go. He said, there'll be one to show you. God has people that'll show you what to do. Listen, friend, today, if the light shined in on you, you say, preacher, I don't know what to do. God's got people that will help you understand what you need to do. You need to give your life to Jesus today. Listen, friend, becoming a born-again Christian, it's got nothing to do with mumbling a prayer. I think you ought to pray. But you can say all the words in the world won't mean anything if you don't have a change of heart. Saul had a change of heart. What you need today is to admit your sinful condition. You need to believe on Jesus, which Saul obviously did. And you need to confess Jesus before the world. That's what he did. He was baptized very shortly thereafter. That was his confession to the world. That he had become a Christian. One who once persecuted Christians, now becomes the chief vehicle of the gospel to the Gentile nation. You're here today as a Gentile. It's partly because of the efforts of Paul that you sit here born again today. We ought to thank God for him. Are you here today without Jesus? Has the light shone into your life? Do you need Christ this morning? Friend, all you got to do is just believe on Jesus. You ask him to save you and he'll do it. Let's pray together. God, it is good to be here amongst brethren this morning. Lord, I pray that these believers right now, Lord, I, I want them to pray in unity, and I believe you want them to pray in unity. 
that if there's a lost man here, that you'd bring the lost person under such conviction that, God, they couldn't help but come to this altar, that they'd give their heart to Christ and be saved even in our presence, that you would be honored. Father, have you will and way in Jesus' name. Miss Shirley's going to play, and you stand to your feet. You need to come to this altar, friends. I want to invite you down here to pray this morning. Maybe some lost person on your heart would you pray for? Would you come and hit the altar this morning for a lost person? Would you come this morning? While you're at this altar, you may be thinking about your friends. You might be thinking about your family. But listen, would you ask God if there's one in this room that's unsaved, would he just do what's necessary with them? Would you come, friend? I know you can pray where you are, but there's something special about God's people just coming together, just praying together. Would you pray? Maybe, you'd, maybe our prayer in unison is it reaches the ears of God. Do you believe God can still save, friend? I do. Do you believe God's got Holy Ghost convicting power? I, I remember when I got saved, boy, God got all over me. I, I was unsaved and I'd cry. I'd, I'd just break down like a shotgun. That's the power of God. And I believe that you can pray for the power of God on somebody's life to the point where they'd be saved. Would you pray this morning, just ask God if there's a soul here unsaved that He wouldn't save them like he has you. You hear this morning, you say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I know Jesus. Maybe you just pray a prayer like this. Say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I realize what this preacher's saying is true. And I need to be saved. I, I place my faith and trust in Jesus. And I ask Him to come into my heart. Lord, come even now. Cleanse me of my sin. And help me to live a new life in Jesus. You pray a prayer like that. I, I believe the Lord will. I, I believe He knows your heart. And I believe He'll change your life. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed this morning. Or you hear you say, Preacher, I just prayed a prayer like that. I just asked the Lord to save me. Would you slip your hand up? Preacher, I just asked God to save me. I followed what you said. I see one hand. Do I see any others this morning? Preacher, I just I, I followed what you said. And I asked God to save me. Any others this morning? I've seen one hand. Do I see any others? Preacher, I've confessed my sin and I've believed on Jesus. Are there any mothers? Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. If you prayed a prayer like that, and you'd like to make that prayer public, you'd like to tell this church that you've decided to follow Jesus, would you step out this morning? Would you step out and just come to the front? you say, Preacher, I, I want to let this congregation know that I've asked Jesus to save me. Listen, I'm not calling anybody out. I'd never embarrass you. But if you've trusted Jesus, you need to come this morning. You ought to come and let these folks know what the decision that you've made. There any others this morning? Any others this morning? Do you need to come? 